But it's, it's very appropriate that, uh, that we, in, this, in a service like this, that we focused on these two age groups of our youth and also our senior citizens, our, our youth and our senior citizens. Now, I know the, how we define that, how we define youth is kind of, you know, you know that's kind of up to everybody. Elementary age, we, we know that's youth, but, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what we call, you know, for example, Aaron and, and Samantha. They're not children anymore. They are still teenagers, technically, but the fact is they're adults. They have adult pressures. They have adult, uh, you know, needs. And by the way, and I don't think it would hurt anything for anybody who wanted to, to, to put a little bit of money into their hands before they leave today. I don't think they would either one be offended by that, and if they are, too bad. Um, college is expensive, and uh, you know they could use a little bit of walking around money, and that wouldn't hurt. But you know, so so youth can be defined, you know, by differently by every people. Same thing with the other end of the spectrum. You know, we we can, you know, I don't know what I don't know at what age you become. We become, you know, elderly. Whether that's uh, whether that you know some might say six. You know, our, our kids would probably say thirty. But uh, you know. <laughs> But, you know, for most of us, you know, it might be 60, 70, you know, and so forth. But uh, whatever it is, the fact of the matter is, these two age groups, youth and senior citizens, were very, very particular to God. God has a special place in his heart. He's made some very special comments about these two age groups. And uh, they get his favor and get special attention. For example, Jesus, in, uh, you know, one time the disciples, uh, his apostles were trying to keep children away from Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, let me tell you something. Suffer or allow the children to come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. And, and then Jesus followed that up with a, you know, I'm just going to call it what it was. Jesus followed that up with a threat, <laughs> a warning. He said, he said, and by the way, anybody who offends one of these young, uh, these little ones, you know, he said, you're better off if a millstone were tied around your neck and you were cast into the water. So let me just say, please understand, and you know, we have a lot of horrible things happening in the world, but please know, nobody's going to get away with anything in this world, okay? God, God is not silent on, on issues like that, so, so uh, you know, we, we can trust that God is going to do that, but Likewise, then, with the elderly or the senior citizens or whatever we want to call them, whatever we want to call uh, the, those that as, as we get older, Paul, you know, we, we, Job, Job wrote this, you know, God said, hey, there's a way you need to treat the elderly in your, in your community. And here's what, here's what Job said, uh, Job chapter 12 and verse number 12 said, with the ancient is wisdom and in length of days understanding. And he was just simply saying, look, you need to respect the older folks, you know, young people, children and, and teenagers and so on. It, there, is, there is a, the wisest people in this world know who to go to to get advice. Nobody knows everything, but smart young people know where to go to get good advice because wisdom is with the ancient according to God. And, and it doesn't mean that old people know everything. They just think they know. They... <laughs> But they certainly know an awful lot. And this is what, this is what the, the, the writing is here. And then, and then in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse number 32, uh, the, you know, God, God is commanding His people, you shall rise up before the gray head and honor the presence of an old man and fear your God. Now notice he linked those two things together. He said, you know, honor the elderly and fear God. And those two things, you know, are very, very important to God. He said, I am the Lord. Of course, Paul, in his letters to the churches, he wrote often about how young women ought to give reverence and give honor to the older women and, uh, and, and respect them and, and so forth. And, and, and Paul said the same things about, uh, you know, about young men and older men. But Solomon then sort of brought it all together. Solomon brought it all together in the book of Proverbs in chapter number 17 and verse number 6 when he wrote this. He said, children's children are the crown of old men. Three, three generations here. Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. And so we see this relationship and how God is saying, it is so important, it is so important that we, that we recognize these, these age groups. Now, that being all said, that doesn't mean that those in middle ages, or that doesn't mean that those in 30s, those in their 40s, those in their 50s, it doesn't mean that that's an unimportant age, but here's what I think God is trying to tell us. He's trying to say, you know, the very young and the very old, well, they need, they need more support from the rest. You know, the children obviously need help. Children need, need, uh, they need protection and they need guidance and all those things. But you know, and sadly, I think this is, we're failing about this in, in America. The, the elderly are also in, in, in need. I, Her, uh, Howard couldn't be here with us today, but I was thinking about, I was thinking about Howard, Howard Deal. And, and uh, you know, he went from being a decorated military veteran 
to now he has to have somebody drive him everywhere he goes. You know, he has to have somebody help him. And, and that is a very, very difficult thing as, as people get older to be dependent, to, be, to need help. And so, so it's a very difficult thing and, and that, that we talk about. You know, once a person's retired, see, a 40-year-old, uh, you know, a 40-year-old healthy man, a 40-year-old healthy woman, they have the, they have the hope of being able to continue to advance in their careers, to be able to continue to get raises and, and, and so forth. But you know, once a person retires, they've received their last raise. <laughs> you know, and, and in fact, because of inflation, particularly here of late, you know, most people on what we call a fixed income, they're actually losing buying power every single year. And so God is saying, hey, take care of the children, but also take care of our senior citizens. Take care of, of those that have, uh, that have gone on before. Now, that being said then, what I, what I believe that, and, and get into the meat of the message here, what we really need to do then, it, it's, it's just simply not wise. We ought to try to avoid making comparisons among generations. You know, young people, for example, are not to be, we should not expect young people to be as wise and mature as adults, right? But, but oftentimes we do that. Oftentimes, adults look at children and say, man, they're so immature. Well, duh, <laughs> he's five, you know, and, and, and so on. So children shouldn't be expected to be as mature and wise as, as adults. But, but, uh, but you know what God really wants? All the kids, listen, listen, all the children. What God really wants is just simply for you to be the, the most wise and mature five-year-old that you can be. Or, or nine-year-old that you can be. You know, or 12-year-old, or 18-year-old, or 35-year-old. Or See, this is, this is what God, is, this is, what God is, is after. He just simply wants us to be the best we can be at whatever particular age that we are. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that here in just a minute. Likewise, we shouldn't expect 70-year-olds to carry the load physically or financially. You know, 70-year-olds shouldn't be expected to, just simply because they're 70, shouldn't be expected to carry the load financially or physically. However, can I say to all the 70-year-olds-ish, be as physically active and be as, as financially generous as you can be at 70. You get me? And so let me show you this in Scripture. God stresses this in a... There's a verse in Scripture that is about one of the most famous men in the Bible, but it's a verse that almost never gets talked about. And so I want to share it with you this morning. This, this man in Scripture that's probably one of the most famous uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Bible is the man Noah. Everybody knows who... No Noah doesn't really need an introduction. Everybody, All the children in the room, you know all about Noah, right? Noah built an ark and, uh, and put the animals on there. We know all this. But let me show you a verse that almost never gets talked about. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 9, here's what God said about Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, as, as you may know, uh, on the earth at that time, the earth was in a mess. We, know, we understand this chapter is all about how the, the sons of God married women. They created this line of giants and, and all these things that we won't get into today. But the earth was filled with violence. It was a terrible place. There were probably millions of people on the earth. Why did God choose Noah to restart humanity? What was it about Noah that God decided, this is the man that I'm going to restart humanity with. Why Noah? Well, actually, this verse actually tells us everything we need to know about why God chose Noah. First of all, the word perfect there just simply means mature. All right, so, so uh, let me just get, you know, kind of get that out of the way. So why, why Noah? We have a play on words here. There's a play on words within this verse. You'll notice an English word that appears twice, the word generations. So let me talk to you about these two. The word generation, in English, it's the same word. We often think then it has the same meaning, but it actually, those two words, those two references to generations have two completely different Hebrew words. Let me talk to you about the first one. So the first one where it says, these are the generations of Noah. The generations of Noah. That word is actually the Hebrew word toldah. 
It's the Hebrew word tolda, and what it means is uh, it, mean, it refers to genealogies or to descendants and, and uh, ancestors. So, so in other words, when, when, when God is talking here at this first word, this first word generations, it's talking about, it, it, leading up to this, chapter 5 is all about the, the descendants uh, uh, of, of uh, the, uh, the uh, ancestors of Noah leading up to that, and then the verse after this talks about his sons. So this is, refer- when we see this word, and when a, Hebrew, when a Hebrew person would have seen this word, they would have thought ancestors. They would have thought descendants. They would have thought family line. That's what that means. These are the generations of Noah. But notice the, the, uh, the possessive pronoun before the next word generation. Notice it says his generations. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. Now what does that mean? This Hebrew word is a, is a completely different word. And it's, it's, the Greek, it's the Hebrew word door, which means periods of age. Periods of age within his lifetime. In other words, this is the, what God is saying here. Noah was a just man and perfect in his childhood when he was a child. In his teen years when he was a teenager. In his 20s when he was that age. When he was middle age and when he was an older man. And by the way, by the time we meet Noah... He's over 500 years old. That's really vintage. <laughs> right? So what is God saying? God is, the reason God chose Noah is not just because he was a godly man, a, a, a mature man, a, a, a righteous man at 500. It's because he had tried to live his entire life that way. Now, let's be honest. Most of us... Most of us cannot live up to that kind of an example, can we? By the way, that's why there's only one Noah. Well, actually, there's two Noahs. We have another Noah down here. <laughs> Pretty high bar there, Noah. <laughs> Good luck with this one, man. Yeah, you know, so we have this example. Now, what God is saying is he's saying, this is what you strive for. You strive to be what you can be at the age in which you are. Don't compare, you know, we don't compare, you know, a child with an adult as far as their spirituality, as far as their, you know, wisdom and all those things. But, but let's, let's pray and let's hope and let's encourage that child to be the best child they can be. Amen. And let's also, let's also encourage, you know, John is going to turn 80 years old tomorrow. So let's encourage John to be the best 80 year old that he can be. Amen. You see what I mean? This is, this is what this is all about. This is what God is trying to teach us here. And even though we can't live up to this necessarily, the point is this. And it was, it's kind of the title that I, I gave to this. Look, it's never too early. It's never too late. Look, you're never too young to serve the Lord, to live for God. You're never too old to live for God. And it's never too late to start living for God. That's right. Whatever age you are, whatever age I am, you know, God doesn't really care so much. We say this all the time, and, and, and this is so true. God doesn't really care where we've been. But He does care about where we are going. He doesn't care what we've tried, what we've done and failed at in our lives. What He does care about is, what do you want to do with the time you have left? Whether that's 70 years or 7 years. None, none of us have any idea. But this is, the, this is, the, this is what God's trying to teach us. It's, it's never, it's never, you're never too young. You're never too old, and it's never too late to live for God. We celebrate these two young ladies, as I said, who are... Uh, look, I, I, I believe, and again, I, I can only judge from the outside, but I've known Sammy since she was, uh, since she was very ch- young. In fact, I've known her since she was born. And, and, um, you know, and, and, you know, as far as I can tell, Sam, you're two for two in life. You nailed childhood, weren't perfect, you weren't perfect, and you weren't a perfect teenager. But as far as I can see, you're two for two in this thing. Mm-hmm. And Aaron, I've only known you as a teenager. You know, I've heard all the horror stories, and I've seen your rap. <laughs> I, I've seen your rap sheet, but you know, no. <laughs> Look, as far as I can tell, she's two for two. Yes. Yes. You know, she 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 was a good child. Tried to live for God the best she could, and, and as a teenager, and again, I'm not perfect, and none of us know everything. But you know, but they have an opportunity. You know, they have an opportunity that most of us don't have anymore, right? Right. Most everybody in this room, there is a period of our lives or multiple period of our lives where we would look back and say, boy, I wish I could do that again. 
Boy, I wish, I, I wish in that generation of my life I had made some different choices. I had made some, you know, a better. Boy, as I, as I look back now, as I'm older and I look back and I realize, man, the things that were so important to me then, now I realize they're just not that important. And, but you all, you know, they have the opportunity for that. The kids have the opportunity to, to they, they can become Noah. Look, they, they, this can be their testament. What God said about Noah, you kids, God can say that about you because you haven't done anything yet, you know, to, to ruin it. You have this opportunity to live your whole lives for God. You know, most of us don't know what that is, but every one of us have today to live for the Lord. Every one of us have some life left on this earth and it's so important. What are we going to do with that? And, uh, and that's kind of what, that's what this, this is really all about. You know, I, I, uh, we also celebrate everybody today. We celebrate every age because, again, no matter what age you are, no matter where you find yourself, no matter what you're looking back on, we all still have a future to live. Now, specifically, I mentioned John Deal earlier. John, John turned 80 years old, and he is, at this point in his life, he is trying to find his way with the Lord, trying to find his peace with God, trying to use the rest of his life to live for God. But specifically today, because it's John Skeen's 80th birthday tomorrow, and we're going to talk a little bit about you, John. Amen. I'm going to talk a little bit about you. You don't know this is about, you didn't know this was about to happen, but it's going to. I, you know, John, seriously, John is more than just a man in our church. He's an ideal. He's a, He's an, he's an icon. There's, there's something about his life and his experience here that speaks beyond just him as, as, as a person. I, you know, I, he, he's, a, he's a story of hope. He's a story of everything that we're talking about today. That you're never too old. You're never, it's never too late. I'll, I'll come to that story in just a minute. But I want to show you a picture, probably the iconic picture of our church. Now, let me tell you the story. So here's what happened. This was 10 years ago. And, and uh, our church was in its infancy. And uh, Sue was actually the very first person to walk the aisle and trust Christ as Savior in our church. His wife. And, uh, and, and, and Sue and Sherry... Sit down, Sherry. <laughs> My goodness, you have to make it about you. So... <laughs> oh, you're going to see in a minute. It's, she made it all about her. Uh, they, you know, of course, Sherry, we, we, we celebrated Sherry last week in, in the video, but, but they, were, they, they got John to come to church with them. And John was a believer in God. It's not that he didn't believe in God. He believed in Jesus, and he believed in, in you know, that there was a right way to live in this world. He just didn't believe he had ever done it. He didn't believe he had ever lived a good life. At the age of 70, John started coming to our church and he would sit there and every week, you know, he watched Sue walk the aisle and, and become a Christian. And, uh, but every week he would just sit there. And I was invited out to their home one evening and I'll never forget it. I came out at, at Sherry and, and Sue's request. And, and I don't know if that was, I don't know if that was like an intervention for you, if you didn't know about it. I think you knew I was coming, but John and I liked each other. And, 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 um, but we sat down and we began to talk and, and, and we just talked pr plainly and we asked him, I asked him, you know, so what is your hesitation? What is your hesitation to, to just allow God to do what he wants to do and save your soul and, and all of that? And John made a statement that I felt like was honorable, very honorable, stupid, but honorable. <laughs> he said, you know, he said, I've lived 70 years for myself. He said, I've, I've never done anything for God. What, how can I accept this grace from him? How can I accept this free gift from him when I have done nothing for him my whole life? And as I said, I thought it was a very honorable statement. And, you know, and, and, and we don't believe in pressure around here. We don't believe in trying to force people to you know, make decisions that aren't genuine. We just believe in genuine things. And so, so, so we, I left and, and uh, you know, we loved each other. He kept coming. Well, we were getting ready to have a baptism day. We had about a dozen people that were going to be baptized that first year, uh, in, in, in the, late in the year. And, and, and by the way, we're going to have another baptism service here coming up pretty soon. We'll talk about that. But, but we were going to have a, we went out to Delaware Lake. And uh, we were all on the, there were probably 40 or so of us on the beach there to watch these baptisms. And, and before we started the service out there, while we were kind of standing around, everybody was arriving and getting their chairs set up. John came up to me and he said, Pastor, 
is there room for one more? And he shared with me that he privately, between just him and his God, had asked Jesus to forgive his sins and, get, and, and, and make him a child of God. Hallelujah. Now, nobody else knew that. So we started the baptisms and, and, uh, and, and I was out in the water and people were coming out and, you know, we baptized all the folks and Sue got baptized. And at the very end, John got up out of his seat and started walking out into the water. And, and I mean, the crowd just came unglued. You remember that, right, Diane? And, and he came walking out and, and uh, you know, and, and in fact, we'll, we'll all, none of us will ever forget that day. Especially our children. Because Sherry came running, I mean, just running out into this wave splashing everywhere. It looked like a big Coast Guard cutter coming out. And, and I don't know, she didn't think of it, probably just forgot. She was wearing white pants. It's a day no one will ever forget. Sorry. <laughs> but that was... That was New Hope. Amen. See, New Hope's always been a place for the unchurched, the, the, those that are not perfect Christians, places that are not these, not everybody, you know, 80% of New Hope was saved at New Hope. That's how this church grew. And, and, and so it's, it's become very, so this picture has become very, very iconic. And John, here's the point though. At 70 years old, at 70 years of age, John could have said, Watch. He could have said, it's too late for me. He could have said, it's too late for me. I, can't, I, I, I don't have time left to do anything for God. But for the last 10 years, this man has been, has been a huge part, has been a foundational part of this ministry reaching people. He's an inspiration. He's an example. He's not perfect. Still not perfect. But boy, he's honest. And he's gotten up here on more than one occasion and been very honest yep. that he didn't feel like he was the father he should have been. He didn't feel like he was the husband he should have been. And, and, and he still feels in that way in some, in some ways. But boy, he has sure tried to be a man of God Amen. in the last 10 years. And not only has he laid up treasure in heaven because of it, but we, he has just become a part of our hearts, hasn't he? And he's become more than a person. It's this icon of hope, this symbol of hope. 